I know what I'm doing. Okay, here we go. Um, do I need to do anything to flip to my slides? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Buongiorno. Um, welcome. I am Micah Farfour, and I am the Satellite Imagery Analyst at Amnesty International. Um, today, I'm going to talk about satellite imagery for crisis reporting. So as I am from Colorado, I have to spend a lot of time explaining what Amnesty International is. So just in case anyone here has no clue what it is, um, we're basically a human rights organization um, that tries to research and campaign against human rights abuses across the globe. I've been working at Amnesty International for about six years directly now, um, but about four years before that through a consultancy. Um, so within Amnesty International, I work with the Evidence Lab. And the Evidence Lab is kind of a new creation in the last four years or so. Um, and we're a small team of evidence gathering um, experts, and we use photo and video verification mainly to document human rights abuses, but we also use satellite imagery. We look at weapons being used, and also sometimes participatory uh, research. So we ask a lot of people to help us create massive data sets, and then we um, parse through those and try and figure out the answer. Um, so let's continue on. The agenda for today, I know there's a few satellite imagery um, uh, presentations, but what I'm gonna talk about is um, what are some good and bad applications of imagery that I've found in my career. Um, I know satellite imagery is becoming more and more available to everyone. Um, so just some ideas of where I've been able to use it and where I've had challenges. Um, I'm also going to give some suggestions of tools um, and imagery sources that I use kind of on a daily basis. I filtered those out to ones that might be more um, approachable for a lot of the people. Um, I'm going to give a few pointers for viewing and simple imagery interpretation. It's kind of dull moments. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about cultural biases and ethical challenges. Um, that come up when we're looking at satellite imagery. Um, follow that up with a case study. Uh, we did a project on jet fuel supply chain in Myanmar uh, last year. Uh, we used a lot of satellite imagery to try and document that supply chain. And then also I'm going to do a smaller look at a journalist request recently from the Washington Post to look at points um, that were given to them from an algorithm and the challenges with looking for mass graves. So um, if anyone feels uncomfortable with this, there is no graphic footage being shown. But just so you know, this is what we're talking about. So a few more words, and then I'll show the pretty pictures. Um, <laughs> so the remote sensing added value. So if you're talking about a crisis situation, um, a couple of the main things is you can get access to this area. You might not be able to access the area um, immediately, but with satellite imagery, especially because there's so many satellites out there today, you could see it within a few days. Um, there's also um, security impediments. So maybe you don't want to send a journalist to the field. We are often very protective of our researchers, um, but they can still get some visual elements from the ground by looking at satellite imagery. We also look at the temporal attributes and sequencing of events. So, like I said before, tons of sites in space now. Um, and so when you um, are able to document something like an airstrike within minutes <laughs> or um, days of when the event happened, it's much easier for research purposes and uh, documenting those abuses. Um, the analysis can be replicated. So for people in the room who already work with satellite imagery, I could produce an analysis. Someone else could produce the same analysis, possibly come to the same conclusions, most likely, or you know, come to different conclusions. 
Um, we also use it sometimes at Amnesty for planning our field investigations because we do take a lot of time sometimes before we put out reports. Um, so we'll actually use the satellite imagery to see areas where uh, there's a lot of activity or a lot of villages have been burned or a lot of IDPs are located or refugees. And um, we will plan our investigations accordingly. Um, let's see. We also think the satellite imagery is fairly quick, fairly cost-effective way to co corroborate testimony. And then, of course, the pretty picture. <laughs> no one's convinced of words, but if you show them a picture and tell them what's on the picture, then they're pretty good. Um, okay, moving on. Any questions on this? Sweet. I love questions, so. Um, imagery use cases, the good and the bad. So I'm not saying that imagery is bad to use in these cases. I'm saying more that a photo or video might be better evidence. The imagery is just not quite clear. Good ones, super easy, um, usually is the burning of structures. There are a lot of algorithms right now that will um, be able to tell you exactly which structure is being burned um, and how many there are. Um, this is especially easy if the structures are made of highly flammable material, thatch, wood, things like that. Um, large machinery might be doing clearing, might be digging, um, construction, anything like that. Fairly easy. Harvesting or any agricultural or events, those are also pretty easy to cover. Mining, um, if it's not underground. Secured areas, uh, so if you're looking at a certain location and they've added a wall or a fence, maybe on a border, that's fairly easy to see in imagery. Um, airstrikes, they come from above. The damage is usually quite visible from above, um, so those are often ones that we'll look at. Um, this is kind of an odd one, but it'll make more sense when I talk about the bad. Um, large funerals, you can see masses of people. Um, so like Hugo Chavez, when he passed away in Venezuela, it was a sea of people um, in the streets in Venezuela. And then um, we can also look at deforestation, large-scale environmental events. I know people will be talking more about that later, though. Um, the bad. <laughs> so these are ones where I've tried to look at the imagery, and I get really frustrated, basically. Um, protest at night. You can imagine why. <laughs> Satellites actually pass over between, typically between 10 a.m. and 12 local time. Um, does anyone have an idea why that might be that doesn't already work with it all the time? Shadows. Um, so between 10 and 12, you're gonna have the least amount of shadows in an area, but sometimes you want a little bit of shadow because it helps imagine how high the building is, or compare heights at least. But in the afternoon, they started taking images in the afternoon, like say, I think it's between three and four. The shadows are insane. <laughs> so the imagery looks great. It's great for certain cloudy areas, but so many shadows. Um, can be helpful. Most of the time, it's a pain for me. Um, but at night, there is very little imagery that I know of. The US military might know of more. Um, so then we've got super mountainous areas. The way a satellite takes an image, kind of sweeps across the sky, um, it makes a mountain look like an artistic painting, basically. It's just squiggles um, whenever it moves so fast. Uh, have you ever taken a panorama and you move too fast at a point because you get excited and it's just, yeah, a big mess? Same thing with the mountains. Um, so if it's a super mountainous region, like in Afghanistan, the angles, um, how the image is taken, it can just be a mess. Cloudy regions, of course, there is new um, remote sensing data that can actually see through clouds now. Um, it's existed for a while, but it's more commonly used now. Um, but Columbia, you're not gonna find too many satellite images over that area. Um, where else? Niger Delta, only like three months out of the year can you get clear images in that area, so it's a bit of a pain. Um, indoors, I've had people send me videos 
of uh, human rights abuses that have happened indoors and asked me if I can find the location. <laughs> and I have found a few, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not very common. Um, so <laughs> if you're looking at the indoors, that can be very challenging. Um, and then finding one specific person. Um, one of the safety things about satellites is you can't really differentiate one human from another. I could probably look and see one human based on the shadow, but I don't know who that human is. Um, they did try and use satellite imagery to find Joseph Coney in the jungle one time. <laughs> and that was a really long time ago. Might be successful now, but it wasn't then. Um, hand dug graves. I'm gonna talk about mass graves later. Hand dug graves are very challenging. Um, and I'll tell you more about that later, basically. Um, bright, sandy areas. One wouldn't think it, but Niger. I've looked at some abuses in Niger, and it is a pain. Um, the sand will actually reflect light, and so to balance the image, to be able to see like the homes or structures, very, very challenging. And then also, maybe some of the people in here have been in a sandstorm, but that's basically like cloud cover. Like you can't really see anything. It's a mist. Um, it's amazing. And then small arms. Um, so if someone's holding a rocket over their shoulder, I'm not going to be able to see that in an image. I might, if they stand there for a really long time and keep burning the back of the ground, I might be able to pick that up later. But for the most part, small arms are very challenging and you have to have a lot of ground research for that sort of stuff. All of the ones in the bad are not impossible. You just need photo, video, ground research, a lot more stuff that's gonna be a lot stronger. Any thoughts? Okay. So this is just a very quick overview of tools and imagery sources that I most often use that are fairly accessible to people. Um, yeah, they are not very expensive to use, so it's great. Google Earth, but the desktop version. <laughs> if you use the online version, the web version, you're not going to get as many cool tools um, as you do with the desktop version. Does anyone know where this is? Thank you, Perugia. Um, this is where we are. Um, I would point to it exactly, but I, mm, I can guess. Um, so the desktop version will give you a time series. You can look at older imagery, newer imagery. This isn't gonna have updated imagery, most likely, of the location that had an airstrike yesterday. Um, but you will be able to get a base map of the area and understand what it looked like before. Very helpful and the buildings that are there in case there's an important building. Sentinel Hub's EO browser. I think everyone has probably mentioned this. Everyone will mention this. This is possibly your best tool if you haven't used satellite imagery before. It is served up on this platform that's super awesome. It has information, it's an educational tool, has information of what you're looking at. Um, and I don't know if people know this, but Satellite imagery doesn't just take pretty color pictures that we see with our eyes. They also have all these other bands that they're documenting on the electric electromagnetic spectrum. So I'll talk a little bit about more of these that I use anyway, more often. But um, here's just an idea. It's free to just use and browse and like even look at imagery. If you wanna do more tools, things like that, you have to pay a little bit, but, and there's amazing online tutorials to use this, highly recommend it. And I'll show you some clips later that might make you happy, I don't know, makes me happy. Um, Planet Labs, this is a paid platform, quite expensive, but um, not the most expensive. It's not quite like Maxar, who still dominates the market for how much money they charge. Um, but Planet Labs is, they basically flipped the imagery market on the head. 
Um, so before, the high resolution imagery was basically held by Maxar and uh, Airbus, which is the European version of Maxar. Um, they charged very high prices for very high resolution, very beautiful. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Cool. I used to work at Maxar. Um, they uh, will help journalists out um, sometimes. They've never given Amnesty anything for free that I know of, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, they they um, will give some journalists things for free most of the time. Like right now, if you're looking at Sudan, they've put it on. Uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the name where you buy images because I'm not a journalist. Um, they put it online. You purchase it from there. Um, there are people within the uh, Maxar place that will also analyze it and give you some more information. So, the oh, Planet. Oh, sweet. Okay, Maxar will do that. Planet sounds like they will also. That's awesome. Um, they also have some educational um, free programs too. Uh, if you have a certain area that you're very focused on and you want to use it for educational purposes, something like professors in here could do. Um, but yeah, Planet flipped satellite imagery on its head because most of the time people were looking at higher and higher resolution. That was what everyone wanted, was to see better and better. They would spend years and years and years um, building these huge satellites. I got to see one one time, so cool. Um, massive though, so neat. And then you know, when they shoot it up in space and it blows up, the stock tanks. <laughs> so, um, so Planet flipped it and they decided to build smaller satellites that are about the size of this table, send up 12 at a time, um, and just have those rotating around the Earth. They started doing a few of these a year, I believe. Um, if they lost one or two, they were okay with it. Um, and their goal was to cover the entire planet of land surfaces every single day. So they didn't focus on the resolution, um, spectral resolution or the um, visual resolution of it. They focused on temporal resolution, which for us means that we can figure out when the airstrike happened in, over a 24 hour period. So if you look here at the same town that we're in right now, um, they have an image from the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So before you might get an image, I, I, I should have brought it up to compare with some of the other high resolution. You'd get an image maybe once every three months, unless it was like a high value area. Did you have a question? Yes, can you define high resolution? How close can you get uh, today? And does that apply only to highly populated areas or you start having a high resolution blanket coverage of the, of the planet that includes, I don't know, countrysides, remote areas and so on, thank you. So the resolution that planet is trying to use is three meter resolution to cover the entire planet. So basically uh, three meter resolution, you can see buildings. You might be able to detect a car, like a large vehicle, tanks, um, planes. I can see planes, ships, things like that. Um, it's not awesome, but we didn't have this before. Um, sometimes I can actually see airstrikes if they're big enough, damage um, to areas. Um, usually I use it as kind of like the canary to tell me where to look closer with higher resolution imagery. Um, with high resolution imagery that's even higher than that, coverage is not always the best. It depends on who's interested. Um, so if it's a high value area, like a place where Saudi Arabia might be super keen to get images, or China likes to look at my, their mines in China and other countries, Africa, yeah, Africa, um, they'll take images of those areas more often. So for us, it's a little bit of a challenge because usually the human rights abuses aren't happening in those high value areas. But this is also how Planet has flipped it because they have a package now that you can pay a fair amount of money for. You can task the satellites 
in the location that you want to see, um, which is super rad. I used to have this at my old job where I could test the satellites and then I didn't <laughs> when I went to Amnesty, but now I can again. So, and like he said, they are very nice and they will also task. Uh, yes? Well, this is my um, account. So you could take a screenshot of this if you want, but you might not be able to access it later. Um, they do have some free imagery available. I think California, um, I think the um, WRI World Resources Institute has a forestry platform and some of the protected forests all over um, planet has provided satellite imagery, higher resolution satellite imagery, or sorry, the three meter resolution satellite imagery over those areas. So there are ways to look at it. Um, this is just our platform right here. Okay, this is a new one that I learned about. I know some people already know about this, Skywatch. They're Canadian. I love Canadians as an American. Um, so Skywatch, I just used them for the first couple of times. Typically you have to order satellite imagery in large chunks, 25 square kilometers, when all you want is the small town of Perugia, one square kilometer. They sell it in smaller chunks. So it's super, super inexpensive compare it, when you compare it. Um, I think I paid $20 for an image the other day of exactly the area I wanted. So the thing about Skywatch though, is they do not sell Maxar imagery. So it's, you can get some high resolution imagery, but not Maxar. Image Hunter. Um, this guy's based in Colorado. Um, he is a reseller of all the satellite companies. Um, the coverage, all the satellite companies that had, he has access to is pretty extraordinary. Um, and uh, so you can contact him and uh, order a satellite image from him, and he's super helpful. He'll help you go through it and everything. Um, this map, I also use this for investigative purposes because I will actually look at this map and figure out where people are trying to get images. Um, so in Sudan, there are certain places that people are trying to get images right now, and I'm like, why is someone looking there? So I'll like dig into it. Um, I don't know who's trying to get images of Perugia right now, but. <laughs> okay, tips and tricks. Just four very simple things. I'm probably, okay. Use other spectral bands. Satellite, like I said before, is capturing all of these bands. Usually, we're looking at natural color, what we can see with our eyes. When I've had journalists come to me and ask me questions, they'll deliver imagery to me. It's always natural color. So right here, we're looking at Alpha Shear Sudan. I don't think there are any high resolution images public right now, um, but this is using Sentinel-2 freely available satellite imagery through the EO browser on Sentinel Hub. Um, natural color, what can you see, anybody? There's a before and after, April 16th and April 11th. Birds. Um, what do you think are birds, the white things? Burns. <laughs> it's like birds. Yeah. Um, well, those are burns. Um, unfortunately, with this resolution, I do not think we could see artillery unless it was massive. Um, so yeah, very good. This is burned areas. This is the airstrip in Al Fashir. Um, you know, this is unknown at this point in time. Um, I, you know, it's vegetation that's been burned basically. Um, so here it is in false color near infrared. The near infrared band is super helpful when you're looking at burned areas. It's usually used to look at vegetation. Um, and the health of vegetation. So things that are bright red and pink is actually reflecting really high in the near infrared. Um, so you can also look at crops and see deviations in the crops. Um, so can you see where the burning is happening a lot better here? Yeah, it's like bright black. 
Um, so if you see pink trees, don't worry. <laughs> um, let's continue on. And then, this one's not great, I apologize, but this is one I've been practicing with. It's called shortwave infrared sweer. It will actually show like where the fires are happening. So I'm gonna show a better example. It downloaded in a degraded version, so. Um, let's see if this works. So this is Raqqa, Syria in 2017 when the US um, bombarded the area to try and eradicate ISIS while civilians were present. And let's see if I can slow it back. There we go. See that? Um, all the red things are actually fires. So we have another source of remote sensing data, VIRS, but this is also another source for documenting where the fires are actually happening um, in high conflict zones where this happens a lot. You can look at this imagery and see it. So in October, they scaled up their attacks. And this is it on October 15th when they were really, 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 really trying to get rid of them. Um, basically burning the whole town down. Oops, okay. Any questions on that? Okay. This is another very, very simple thing that I um, sometimes forget to do. But when you look at satellite imagery um, on Google Earth Pro desktop, sometimes the buildings are sideways. And I don't know about you, but my brain cannot process imagery when buildings are sideways. Um, <laughs> It has no idea what's going on. I've had situations where I'm trying to figure out if the cell phone towers are standing or if someone came in and tried to eradicate the cell phone towers and that's why we can't get access to people on the ground. So if you rotate the image and there is a dial on Google Earth so the buildings are standing, you can actually see that there is a ship in the middle of the buildings. This is Hong Kong. I don't know if anyone's ever been there and been on this ship but I found it one day and I thought it was very interesting. So, sorry, I'll talk a, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, a tool tips, tricks. Um, one of them is to look for patterns. Uh, I'll talk more about that. And then also to zoom out. This was something I was taught a long time ago um, in my internship, but sometimes you're drilled in so close to the image and then if you zoom out, you actually get a ton more perspective. And you might actually find that like, you know, a hospital was bombed nearby, but you're so focused on like this plane at the airport that you don't see the hospital. Okay. Cultural biases and ethical challenges. Um, I was raised in the US. When I look at an image, I have to kind of try and blink my mind out to what I'm actually looking at and make sure I don't assume it's something that it's not, basically, because this is my culture, this is where I was raised. So here's Jebel Mara. Um, this was taken a couple days ago. Um, this is another near-infrared image. As mentioned before, this shows burning. Uh, the black areas over there on the left. So. It's been thought before and put online before publicly that this is because of the fighting. But if you look at April, every year since 2017, you can see this area typically burns every year in April. So while some of the burning could be related to the fighting. You have to look closer. Don't make assumptions, basically. Just because, you know, you live in a place where they don't burn the fields, like Colorado. We try not to have any fires there. They happen still. Okay, so ethical challenges. This was one I did actually before I was directly working with the Amnesty. Um, this was Sinjar in Sinjar, Iraq in 2014, maybe some people remember, um, the Yazidi people were basically attacked um, by ISIS, ISIL, I believe. 
um, and they fled up the mountain. This happened so quickly. It was astounding to see an imagery, just like cars all over the place. And I was just on top of it. I did this in like, I don't know, I worked for like 16 hours before algorithms existed, pinpointing each vehicle. There's over 500 vehicles in this image um, with these yellow dots. <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I was zoomed in to the image, um, I had better access so I could zoom into it. This is just an overview that we created for exposition purposes. Yep, you can see the vehicles. Um, but I had also pinpointed all the tents of all the people. And since we published this about a week after, or days after the event had happened, Amnesty actually came back to me and said, can you delete all of those other points so we don't create targets? And I'm like, ah, yes, <laughs> this is a very good idea. So sometimes I get so um, into the work that I forget about some of these ethical challenges about putting some of this stuff out too quickly. Um, I do think that Maxar tries to think about that. They might also um, you know, help out and not put things out too quickly. Um, but yeah, this was interesting project. Okay, um, so now I'm just gonna talk about a recent report uh, that we put out on the Myanmar jet fuel supply chain. So we had had researchers go to Myanmar or document airstrikes in Myanmar, plenty of airstrikes in Myanmar. Then we had a researcher that was leaked some documents about the jet fuel supply chain. She's in business and human rights. And so I'm gonna play a video here. We'll see if it works. Amnesty Yellow, just in case you forget. <laughs> Um, so yes, so we were looking at the supply chain in Myanmar, specifically related to this one uh, company called Puma. And uh, they were bringing in jet fuel into the country and uh, the military was actually getting their hands on it and using it to put in their jets to conduct these airstrikes. If you end the jet fuel, then possibly you end the airstrikes. So the first thing the researcher asked me to do was to find all of these uh, fuel depots from the company. And so she had a list of all the airports they were at. But she wasn't quite sure what a fuel depot looked like. I didn't know what a fuel depot looked like. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of people on the internet put points everywhere. And so I found one location, I think there are a couple now, um, that pointed exactly that this was one of the fuel depots in Heho, um, Myanmar. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I apologize now. Um, and so I was able to look back in time. So they updated a lot of these fuel depots in 2016, between 2016 and 2018. Um, the updates included um, security and um, just regular safety updates, which include this round like entrance and I don't know if anyone here has ever driven a fuel truck full of jet fuel I have not but I can imagine you don't want to get into an accident 
So <laughs> providing an easy way in to deliver the fuel and an easy way out seems like a smart safety feature to me. There's also a few other things. Um, this company decided to brand itself in green. So a lot of the roofs were changed to green, which is great, um, super easy to see. Um, it's basically a giant sign. And then also there's uh, a few like updates to the facility. It looks like maybe some paint, things like that. So this is Hejo. Here we have Sitwe before in 2016. And this is it after it's been updated. So I'm just showing the, the path that the truck might take with the yellow um, arrows. Uh, the blue shows the new roofs. And then the orange, that's an updated storage tank there. It's fairly easy, um, but it can add a lot of value. So with that, I was able to pinpoint six, seven other locations, including one that was shared with the military because the other location was not active. So after I found these locations, I went through and checked for activity of fuel trucks. So in this last one here, I can point to it here. Um, you can actually see fuel trucks there. Any questions on this? Uh-huh. I'm just kind of curious at the starting point, how you sort of target these locations. Do you have like a list of airfields in Myanmar or do you have no. human sources that are telling you start looking at these locations and then you narrow it down from there? Mm -hmm. So for this particular incident um, or situation research, we actually had a list from Puma. I think they had it on their website. Um, but I also have done a lot of work in Myanmar and I think I know all the airstrips in Myanmar. China may have built a few that I don't remember, um, but yeah. Um, and I did actually look beyond these airstrips just to make sure um, at, a, at like a dozen or so, and I didn't see any updated fuel um, storage areas. The interesting thing too is not every airport has fuel storage, and especially um, something of this caliber. So looking around, you find uh, some places with it and some places without it. Okay, um, so here we were able to document the fuel trucks moving in and out. Then she also received some information on ships that were directly linked to Puma carrying the fuel, and I was able to pinpoint this in the port where Puma, this is like Puma's ports um, in their affiliates where they store the jet fuel. And they, they said something like, oh, well, we haven't been delivering fuel, but we were actually able to pinpoint ships that were about the same size, well, are the same size, same color, same style as the ships that we found on uh, some ship tracking records. So this was at Tilawa port in Myanmar. And then we were also able to find some in Thailand and Singapore. Um, this is an example of using all of your resources. This imagery, not awesome. <laughs> but I can measure those ships with this imagery. This is planet three meter resolution taken daily. I can measure the size of those ships. And we also had some very specific data on which bay they were in. So um, I'm not saying these are the ships. They could have easily left right before and another one came in. But these are the same size, shape, and color as the ships we were looking for. And then I was looking at jets and air bases. Jet activity on the air bases was pretty high um, during the airstrikes timeframe. Um, we still monitor the jets on the air bases. You know, we, we don't have, we're not completely clear where some of them get their jet fuel, but at this point Puma has stopped delivering fuel to the area. Um, to Myanmar, and they're getting jet fuel from someplace, but we're not quite sure yet where. So that's quite good. Any questions on this research? Okay. Algorithms and mass graves. I put those together. <laughs> Algorithms have not been able to find mass graves yet that I have, been, that I have seen. Um, I'm not saying this can't happen, but it's difficult. Um, I look at a lot of imagery, and I have a hard time finding these alleged mass graves. Um, it's basically 
you need a lot more time, a lot more work, and a lot more Im imagery, ground photos, site visits, things like that. But people are still trying, and that's awesome, because the algorithms are getting better and better every day. So I was given some points by a Washington Post um, researcher, um, journalist, sorry. They're all researchers in my mind. Um, and she was like, I don't quite understand what's going on here. And I was probably one of a few people that was asked about this. Um, and she had been delivered these points by um, some very, very smart professors, uh, Corey Scher from City University in New York and Jamin Van Den Hoek from Oregon State University. They developed an algorithm for this particular situation to look at the near infrared bands before and after and see any deviations in areas. They also went through and filtered things that could be related to agriculture or what have you. And they came out with a ton of points. Journalists sent them to me, asked me what I thought about them. I basically said I thought they were all too difficult to tell. Um, so yeah, graves are difficult. So here, I'm sorry, it's quite dark. I'm gonna see if you guys can see the changes. This is gonna be a little bit hard. I apologize. My eyes are really attuned to strange things. So this is before. You're looking in the pink circle, but also look all around, please. This is after. Do you see anything? Sorry? It seemed, sorry, it seems like it got a little bit lighter from this far off. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, I balanced the colors pretty well. Yeah, so the thing that was the kicker for me is over here, you see those light colored dots and then the field like halfway right there? There's actually probably people in that field in this image harvesting it. So that's pre, that's post. The very, very annoying part of the timing of this event when the Eritrean forces came into this area and reportedly killed a bunch of people after they were um, attacked on the road in Tigray, um, is it was harvest season. So while we're looking for mass graves, we're also trying to figure out which ones could be graves and which ones are just areas being harvested. Very challenging without any ground information. So the one in the pink circle, as mentioned, it actually got lighter. So when I'm looking at this, I would have to throw that data out basically because without someone there looking, I'm gonna say it's a harvest. Thoughts, questions, mass grave concerns. Um, there are situations where we can document um, graves, new graves. If they're located in cemeteries, we're pretty confident about those. If we're able to visit the area, we're pretty confident about those. Um, sometimes if we have ground and photo videos, um, we're probably confident about those. And then um, machinery. If machinery is used to build the larger grave sites, this happened a lot in Syria back in the day, that's very, very easy to kind of come to some more information if you see machinery and they're digging a long trench. Okay, I think most of the time people have a lot of questions on mass graves. Thank you. I didn't bring that up, but we've also had some people do geospatial analysis on the most likely area that someone would build a mass grave. So if you think about it, I feel like building a, putting a grave in the middle of your field is not great. You don't want to plant your crops there. It's probably, in most cultures, I think that that's not very acceptable, but I'm making that assumption because of my biases. Yeah, but they would put it on the edge of their field. Like, this is, this wasn't, these people were not buried by the Eritrean forces. The Eritrean forces came in and killed, supposedly killed a bunch of people. 
according to reports, the people who buried the bodies were the locals. Yeah, so you're right, you're, you're completely correct. Um, other things I look for when I'm actually looking for the potential for something being a grave, paths. Um, if there are enough bodies that are being buried, a vehicle probably carry them there, depending on what part of the world you're in. If you're looking at a hand dug grave that is in Ethiopia, often um, buried people might have been buried by farmers. It's really hard without ground photos, some sort of truth beyond um, the satellite imagery. Um, yes? Um, do you have any information about how the algorithm is trained, like what it's trying to pick up on, and, and whether or not you can sort of see, like is it looking for areas that are darkened or lightened, mm -hmm. and can you use that to sort of figure out why it might be picking up a certain area, and what that actually might represent, if not in that way? Yeah, so uh, I will put you in touch with Jamin. Um, but yeah, basically the near infrared band, he's looking for changes in kind of the spectral, um, uh, the spectrum there. And so he went, I'm pretty sure they compared before and after of the near infrared band, looked for any changes, and then eliminated the ones that were likely related to like agricultural stuff. Um, so. But yeah, he's got more information on it. They're also starting their own organization called False Color Labs. I'm guessing it's gonna be in the summer since they're professors. Um, and he'll be able to help journalists provide very quick information such as this. I'm guessing he developed it. Uh, he is a professor in remote sensing, so I'm guessing he developed it with uh, his colleague and friend. Yeah, anything else? Okay, so enough about mass graves. Now we're gonna do something that's a little bit fun, I hope. Um, <laughs> so I don't look at death and gloom all day, <laughs> every day. Um, so does anyone have Id any idea what this might be? You learned a little bit about satellite imagery. Um, any thoughts? Call out anything you might see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whatever's here. Whoop, sorry. I apologize for that thing. Um, that's really shiny, so it's like reflecting a lot of light. Probably man made. Oh, it does. Um, that is not sand, though. That's a good thought, though. There was a wide bend in the turn. Uh huh. Oh, could be, yep. Ah, yeah. yeah, happy things. Let's flip our minds. <laughs> um, yeah, it does reflect light. I mean, solar panels reflect a lot of light too. I, I actually probably think they probably have solar panels there too, uh, based on the remoteness of this location. Okay, well, there are a lot of trees. So can you kind of have an idea of where in the world this might be? Place with a lot of trees, obviously. Colorado. Still likes their trees. Colorado? Colorado? Gosh. <laughs> it's not on fire. <laughs> kind of. Um, no, this is not Colorado. But yeah, that would be awesome. Canada, thank you. Um, I love it, but it's not Canada. Tropical, thank you. Tropical, it is tropical. Are there any roads? Gabon. Gabon. Okay. It's tropical. Do you guys see any roads going to it? Ooh. Yeah. There are lots of roads going into the Amazon right now, unfortunately. Um, okay. So I, it took me a while to figure this one out, but. Yeah. I saved you guys $150, because that's how much it costs to visit this place. Um, yeah, so this is a sky bridge in Malaysia. Um, it, we can look back at the image now if you'd like to. Um, I, this is a gondola, so you actually somehow access this gondola, go up to that area, and access the sky bridge. And you're able to look at natural virgin rainforests there in Malaysia. Um, 
It's on my bucket list of places to go someday when I'm there. Okay, I think we're done.